the average Australian garage is 3.4 meters by 5.8 meters, which sounds great and big, except when you have to share it with the car, the boat, the kids, and anything else you can put in there. How are you supposed to get anything done? Hey everybody. Hello, welcome to the tiny workshop. Patrick, you're back. I am back. I had a bit of a jaunt up in New South Wales, saw my partner's family. My God's country. Visited New South some Wales, yes. beautiful beaches. It was 25 degrees every day. In Yamba. Yeah. Yamba. Yeah, and uh, Bellingen. Bellingen. Mm. I come from Ballina, which is just north of Yamba. Um, perfect part of the world, but I don't know, I like the Melbourne winters. So. Yeah, I miss the cold. Yeah, cold. <laughs> Um, welcome to back to the tiny workshop. Um, tonight we've we we've got a bit going on. Patrick's been away, so we threw us a little bit, and um, you're feeling a whole lot better now. So yep. everything is great. We actually decided we we finished up this stool, but Patrick um, sort of had a look at it. And you weren't happy, were you? Look, I expected to come back and just put some oil on it, get the glory, but I think it's there's a couple of bits and pieces that still need to be done, which, you know, I'll forgive this time. I'd like to put a chamfer on the top. Fine. Just to make it a little smoother on uh, old mate's underside of his legs. I know, because you can shave ham with that. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. sharp. Um, and also, it's a little bit rocky. So we're going to deal with that. Um, and I'll show you a tricky technique to fix that up. Yeah, okay. Anything else before we get started? Well, I think that tonight, after we do this little stool, and we're going to give it a coat of oil. We're using a, a, a Levos product here. We're going to have a break and do, look at water stones. Um, and then after the break, we're going to do the classic sharpening episode. We thought we should do a sharpening episode. Everyone does a bloody sharpening episode, but the Tiny Workshop hasn't done one yet. So we thought we'd do ours. Um, so that'll be after the break. So you're going to stick around tonight and watch the program. And remember, if you're watching this show for the first time, or you're still a little bit unsure, I don't know, make sure you subscribe to our channel and press the bell. So over to you, Patrick. All what right. are you going to do? Well, I reckon we'll start by leveling this stool. So yeah, okay. one thing that's inherent to remember about a stool or a table like this where the legs are fully integrated into the top, what I mean by that is you don't have a frame with a top. The legs are glued into the top. You're not managing tension. Yeah, no so yeah. what can happen in a slab like this is, yeah. especially before it's oiled, if there's any change in moisture, it could bow slightly, and that will affect whether or not the stool is level. Let's have a look. See if we've got we get a close up on that, Shelton. Oof. No, it's, it's actually pretty good. Actually, perfectly level. It's just bad workmanship that's <laughs> resulted in this. So we thing. can't blame the timber. <laughs> Once this is oiled, hopefully it won't move too much, but it's something to keep in mind. But we can tell that two of the legs are either long or two of them are short, doesn't really matter. We're only going to mess with one of them. Yeah, we're not, well, we're not going to shorten two of them. Yeah, because you could sort of start there and then go there and go there and then go there and then this thing's like this yeah, one. Yeah, and, you know? and for like, yes, there would be a true level for this, but it's just not important for a, a, a little bench. Well, they're not mm. taking spacecrafts, aren't they? Yeah. On it and stuff. And I'm sure Derek won't mind that it's one millimetre yep. lower on one side, but hey, you know, some people are very detail oriented, like our dear friend Tom, but we won't talk about that right now. So okay. how are you going to actually do this? So first of all, I've established that these two legs on the outside are the longer ones, because that's what it's sitting on. Mm. I've got it on a piece of flat stock here. Um, this assumes that the workbench that you're working on is flat and this piece of material is flat. We're going to slide this off so that one of those long legs, I don't care which one, is sitting off this stock here. Do you want to have a, have a get in close here, Shelton, while I demonstrate this? If you don't have anything super flat lying around in the workshop, really great flat objects are things like the tops of saws. Mm, like absolutely. Saws. Yeah, when I, when I tested this today in my workshop, I used the top of my table saw. Shelton's singing voice, that's pretty flat. So like, oh, stuff like that. Oh, that's rough. a bit harsh, isn't it? Pipes of an angel. Um, okay, so what this has allowed us to do is this leg is overhanging this reference surface by the amount that we need to remove. So we can get our marking knife, making sure that you are, yeah, John's holding that down so it's not going to fall down this side. And we can run the marking knife 
along this edge to scribe a line. And now I've got some of the same material that's the same thickness. I can scribe that line the whole way around and then I know exactly how much material we need to remove. Once you've done that, you can remove it in any number of ways, but oh, the way we have decided to do it. Oh my God, is that a bow, whatever it's called? It's the, the yoga mat for woodworkers. Mm. Um, I've got one of these in my shop. My only complaint is I feel like I need more of them because when I put something down like a dining table, I want like one under each corner. Yeah, yeah. So, but they are handy, they're nice and soft, stops things scratching. So we've got the leg that we've marked here, we've got the scribe line, we know how much we need to remove. You could do this with a chisel. Yeah. You could do it with... We did that last week though, yeah. we did it on the top. So what we're going to do... Are you going to clamp that to the bench yeah. and then drop a belt sander on top of it? And the reason we have the scribe is so we can see, we can just touch it, take it off, look at it. It's about a mil to remove, so it's going to be noisy for, wanna, I'd say a good... Do you want to clamp that down? Yeah, I will. I'd say... We'll go to the stable and get a couple of ponies. Yeah? We thought of a great ad for pony. Like the little kid comes up to dad. Dad, can I have a pony for Christmas? And then, you know, it writes itself, that stuff. Yeah, really, so. absolutely. All right, I'm going to hit this with the belt sounder. So you want to make sure that you're not taking it off uneven. See, I'd approach this differently though, because that scares me, because you get a little bit of flex. Yeah. And then you get a jump, uh -huh. and you start to skip and it bounces. And what, it's like, geez. What would you like to do? Well, I, I don't, we'll try this. This could be entertaining. What I would do is clamp it to the bench and just have the leg sticking out. But yep. it's a bit difficult because it's round. Yep. We had that mox advice that would be handy yep. as well. But it doesn't matter. I we'll think it'll be this. okay. It'll be fine. It'll be whether You've my done this arms can hold this weight. Yeah. Well, we can always drop my stomach on there. That'll hold yeah. it down. So. Going to make some noise. Really should be wearing glasses. See? <laughs> I think you'll be okay. Belt sound, you'll be fine. Check my scribe, a little bit more. Check my scribe. It's staying pretty flat. I reckon we're there. Okay. There you go. Now, if it's still rocking, I'm gonna call it the table's fault and we're gonna move on. Look, it's good this way. Yeah, when you turn it that way, it moves. Let's, um, let's I, call that done. I reckon it's done. It's done. And we'll move on. Yeah, this um, is the problem with doing something like this on a non-flat. But I mean, to be fair, floors aren't flat. It's inherently going to rock. So put some felt on it and that'll stop it rocking. We can also touch it up later. What do you think of my belt sander? I love it. Love I it. bought that belt sander 25 years ago. It's done a hell of a lot of work. I built a whole kitchen out of brush, brush box once, one yep. Christmas, belt sanded the whole thing by hand. Makita, uh, I don't care what anyone says, that's been a great tool. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, I've got a big old one like that too. Yeah. Fantastic. Top edge. Going to do a chamfer. So I've got a really nice Freud uh, router bit, chamfering bit in my trimmer. I always go to my trimming router over my large router if I can. It's just so much easier and more pleasant to work with and with a with a cut like this that is going to be a finished surface, especially somewhere really visible, you want to use a really good quality router bit because if the bit's crummy and you, it's not sharp enough, you will get tear out. There are some places on this tabletop that are more prone to tear out than others. And they would be where the blade is going to be interacting with the grain in a way that it could rip it out. So. Did this, you sort of go against the grain essentially? So at that yeah? point, because this chamfer is so small, we can go against the grain. Yeah. From here around, absolutely fine. Mm. From here, could be a trouble. From here around, absolutely fine. Hope that makes some sense. Um, Do you want me to hold it? Oh, yeah. We're I good mean, at holding stuff. Maybe we'll just throw this down oh, so it doesn't the vibrate. Brain mat. The bow mat. The bow, bow mat. Alrighty. That actually is really effective, isn't it? Yeah, it's good for this kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay, I'll put my... Do you want your glasses? Oh, I think I'm okay for this. Okay. Alrighty. Making some noise.
Oh, one more thing. We just got a chamfer, the bottom that we just cleaned up here. Of course. Let's do that right now. Okay. Now. I think we can put some oil on this. Shall we? Oh, I will, I'll fetch the oil. Excellent. Right, so we've got this um, Levos countertop oil. This is a great product. I've, you would have seen I did a video one time on restoring a table. It wears really well. Um, it also, uh, well, I won't go into that too much. What I like about the fact is that I did that project about that much hair ago, right? <laughs> it was, I think that was pre-COVID. And um, the can was half empty. And I don't know if you can get a shot of that, but that has not dried out. And I'm actually quite impressed with that because a lot of oils that have, um, this is like, a, I guess you would call it like a, a hard wax oil of kind. Especially if they've got a polyurethane or something in them, they tend to just go off and you lose half a can. This one has actually not dried out at all and uh, we're good to go. What so, I tend to do with half cans of stuff is I've started buying those flexible plastic water bottles. Um, people use them for hiking sometimes. You can get them on eBay. There is actually a brand called Stop Loss Bags, but they're really expensive. Hiking, you call it hiking. It's bush, we're in Australia, mate. Bushwalking. Bushwalking. Um, anyway, you can buy them online. Any kind of flexible bag, even like a goon bag. You put your, your product. <laughs> that's an Australian word, so you, yeah. You put your art. Uh, for those who are overseas, that's a uh, box wine bag. Flexible. Box wine bag, yeah, and you can use it as a pillow. Oh, multi purpose. And stuff. Um, if you put this stuff in a flexible container, you can push all the air out of it, you don't lose any. And you don't have this gummy stuff on the lid. But okay. it relies on you having a couple of flexible bags. We better get some oil on this, cool. yeah? Get into it. Oh, oh, right, I'm in charge of that. Great stuff. Um, thing about this Livos product is yeah. it's totally safe to put on your hands with no gloves. It's um, a food, food safe product, child safe. It is a really thin film build. So unlike some of the, um, for dining tables, I'll really often use the Evolution hard wax, which is a slightly thicker film. This stuff goes on a lot thinner and then you wipe off the excess and you're left with a really, um, a really kind of lush natural look you're really seeing the surface of the timber rather than any kind of film that's left on the surface. Right, so... Oh man, that colour is popping just yeah, beautifully. Like, just show the camera, yeah. That is stunning. So I found when I did my dining table, you're looking at probably three to four coats, depending on the material. And you get a real... Then you, it's funny with oil too, that la, the, when you've got the right number of coats on there, boom, out it comes. So let's just flip her over. Yep. Put that on the, here come the battens with a bit of tape on them and do the underside, yeah? Now, we're, what we're going to do right now is that, good point before we cut to the break, is that whenever you're oiling something or even sanding something, move it into a position that's easy to use, to work on. So flip it upside down, have battens ready, have pads so you can get the object in the right position. It'll save you a whole bunch of heartache. So... We're going to cut to a short break while Patrick oils this off. Um, make sure you come back because we're going to get into sharpening after the break. See you very shortly. Hi there, welcome to this tiny workshop, tiny tips segment. My name's John Madden. Now, tonight's episode is all about, well, most of the show is all about sharpening. So I'm just gonna run through five fun facts about water stones. Fact number one, water stones, don't drop them. They don't like it and you can't claim it under warranty. Fun fact number two, water stones require soaking in water to make them functional, but you don't need to leave them soaking 24 seven. 
when you finish using them, let them dry out. The other point is too that high grit stones like 10,000 grit don't really absorb water so you don't need to soak them at all. Just use a spray bottle. Fun fact number three, you got to keep your stones flat. You can see on this stone this dark patch indicating that there's a hollow that's no good for sharpening. Get yourself a stone flattener and flatten away. Fun fact number four. When you're cleaning your stones in water, try not to mix up the grits. If a coarse grit contaminates the fine stone, it'll upset the sharpening process. And also, write the grit of the stone on the side in black permanent marker, because after a while, you forget which one is which. Fun fact number five about water stone sharpening. Keep it simple. You don't need elaborate setups to get good results. Three stones, 1,000 grit, 6,000 grit, 10,000 grit. A good flattening stone. A piece of Tupperware to soak in, stolen from the kitchen. A squeezy bottle. Some sort of leather strop and some honing compound. And really importantly, a really good quality sharpening guide is all you're ever gonna to need to get a great edge. Thanks for watching this tiny workshop, tiny tip on sharpening. See you back in the workshop. How's it going, John? Well, we've, um, we've put a coat of oil on, and I'm just getting the excess off. You don't want any oil, as you would know, on the surface after you're boiled, because otherwise you get some unattractive little Globs all over it. It's not cool. It's meant to be below the surface, not on the surface. Golden rule. So yeah. we need to let this dry for I don't know overnight. It's probably a yeah. cold at the moment. Maybe eighteen hours. Cut it back. I, I instinctively will cut it back with steel wool yep. or some very fine um, sandpaper and do it again. Wash and repeat. The nice thing is about um, I don't have any handy, but. To illustrate, no, the, in the space like this, when you're doing an oil finish, I think we touched on it last week, is that I can throw a handful of dust on that mm. and set it aside and it's not going to affect the product at all. Yeah, it's not a, it's not a tacky product. Mm. Um, yeah, it doesn't leave a sticky finish. And, so. oil, you, and if you get anything stuck there, you can just sand it off and do it again. So if you're working in a tiny workshop where everything happens in the same space, oil's the way so to go. Much, so much easier. Also, um, the shinier you want this, the more coats you put on. So yeah. if you, it gives you a lot of flexibility in that finish. All right. Should we get to some um, sharpening? We well, did, I think we better. We're going to run out of time. We did promise think, people oh, sharpening. Apparently, there's some Canadians and people from the United Kingdom watching. Hello, brothers. How are you? They don't want. They want to know what time it is. Now it's about what seven. Tw Twenty past seven. Twenty past now, seven. If you own an iPhone, mate, look in the settings, all right? That'll tell you exactly what's going but on. Thanks for it'll getting up early. It'll and... even tell you the weather, but 20 past seven in the evening. So, okay, we're in Melbourne, yeah? All right. So do you want to start off with how you normally yes, sharpen? We do, I will. Now, we're into the sharpening episode, and some of you may have been wondering why there's a picture of Gary Rosolo, the big brother on the wall. We were hoping to get Gary into the showroom, into the workshop tonight to um, show us how... Um, to really critique our work. Yeah, and I expect him to walk through that door anyway. Maybe he's banging on it. I did lock the outside door. Uh, because Gary's a, a very high-level craftsperson and he's embarrassed me more than once with his sharpening abilities. Yeah. So we remember, Rosolo was watching. If you want to get a sharp edge, yep. Rosolo sharp. Um, Don't stop sharpening until Gary would be happy. Yeah, so you'll need to talk to Gary. So you're going to get John and Patrick sh sharp, which is still not bad. So I've got my little kit here, which is basically a tub of water kept in a um, Tupperware container. You can spend hundreds of dollars on products that'll hold your stones. I've never really understood why you would do that, but that's just me. I have seen some pretty fancy... Um wet stone fountains that people have built. Ooh, have you seen those? A fountain. It's I like, like a, a little fountain. cedar bath and the, and the water runs over the wet stone. It's, it's all a bit, bit over the top. Yeah, so 
These are uh, the stones I've got here. I, I love a water stone. I like a flat water stone. I actually own a whetstone grinder, which Patrick will demonstrate next. Um, but somehow, I don't know, I find using water stones really meditative. Mm. I don't know about you. Bordering on boredom, but um, if you've got to resolve a life problem or you want to listen to a new album, ah, go and, uh, go and um, do some water stone sharpening. So... Critical thing about water stones is that you need to soak them in water. And I've just popped those in there. These are already pretty saturated, but I should have probably done it earlier, but I didn't. Uh, the nice thing about them is that they're relatively simple to use, but the key thing was is to keep them flat. You don't need to soak them in here all the time, as I said in the video previously, but you do, when you stop using them, just take them out and let them dry. Do you let yours soak? Some people do. I leave mine in water all the time. Really? Yeah. Why? So they're always wet. <laughs> always wanted to, well, I don't think you need to do that, but that's just me. So it's not, it's not because I think the stone will be unhappy if it's dry. It just means I don't then have to spend the time soaking it. Yeah, okay. Two schools of thought. Actually, I should have checked with you earlier. We should um, ask Gary. Yeah, we'll see. The Rizzolo effect, would, he'd know. Um, Gary, if you're listening, can you let us know? Actually, people out there, can what's the was, can we do a vote or something on what's the most... Soak or not to soak? Do you leave your stones in water all the time, or am I just exceptionally lazy? I think you... I don't know if you're lazy. You're kind of <laughs> industrious. So you, you make sure your stones flat. This is a 1,000 grit, and... The critical first step when you're chewing it, I mean, this chisel's in reasonable shape. Yep. This one here is not so, you can deal with that one. Um, the first thing you've got to do is make sure the back's flat. And the way, you, the way you do get the back of a chisel flat is to just pop it down there like so. And, you know, it's not complicated, just push it back and forward. I like using a squeegee bottle too, just to keep that surface really moist. You do get like a, if it, if it gets too dry, you get a, a build up of the chalkiness from the stone and any metal particles, it gets really dark and sludgy. So the extra water on there, if you have a stone fountain or a water bottle sprayer, that'll, that'll keep some of that sludginess at bay. Yeah, but I don't mind the sludge either. You, you don't want too much. You can probably catch that on the camera. Um, as the stone breaks down, because water stones are designed to break down to create a sludge. And the sludge actually is the process or it assists in the process of sharpening. So every so often, um, you might, if it gets really mucky, you can just sort of rinse that off, pop it back down, and then return to sharpening heaven, which is back and forward, back and forth. It's like, it's like Olympic swimming, up the pool, down the pool, up the pool, down the pool. But they don't hand out any awards for being a hero for doing this. So Would you, um, would you ever use something, is there a reason you'd ever use something coarser? Than, than a thousand. If I dropped this chisel on the ground, which I haven't lately, yep. um, I would consider it because then you can remove more material faster yep. in order to get any chips and dings and stuff out. But this chisel is essentially in very good condition. So Also, if you've bought a second hand chisel and it has <clears throat> some rust pitting, <clears throat> uh, also, yeah, it, may, it may have never been flattened before. So yeah. you, you might need something a little coarser than a 1,000. Yeah. So you could go with a 600 grit stone, or you could potentially use a coarse uh, diamond stone, yeah. which... Ah, well, that's a good, nice segue. Thank you. Um, where is the diamond stone? Oh, there it is. Okay, so another option is to go with a, a diamond stone. Uh, this is particular one is a 1,200 grit. I don't use them personally because I kind of enjoy this experience. Um, a lot of people who are working in um, more manufacturing spaces where you, you know, carpentry, uh, cabinet making shop, where you just want to whip up an edge. Yep. Very popular for that sort of thing. Key question, do you lubricate diamond stones? I've always used mine in the same way that I use my wet stones. Ooh. I always use them with water. Ooh, okay. Again, I don't... Uh, tell us what your opinion is, oh internet, oracle of the internet. <laughs> Every, Quite a conversation. Uh, uh, please <laughs> bestow your wisdom. Um, I don't know. I've never. I, I think a little bit of that camellia oil okay, is sure. very nice. Yep. Uh, I think the manufacturer would say, "Well, you don't really need to use anything." But mm. um, again, personal preference because you've got to find a style that suits you and um, the kind of work you're doing and how fast you want to be. Exactly. All right. So this chisel here, if we can get a close up of that, please, Shelton, you can see how that chisel 
is perfectly grey. There's no shiny bits on it. Yeah, it's this really uniform colour, and you can see the part that you've shot that you've made flat, and the part that, that the stone really hasn't touched at the back there. If there was any little shiny bits, and you often see them along the back of the edge itself, that means little shiny bit. That means it's not flat. You've got to cut that away until you get a dull grey. Like it'd make a nice car finish for some sort of metal car or something. You know. So phase one, very important, flat in the back. Phase two is the set and edge. Oh, now I use Veritas. This is my own personal one. She lives in her original box, and I love her. Why? Because this is the best sharpening jig on the market, guaranteed. There is other styles, and we have this version here, which we also, we sell at TimberCon, which is a great product. A hell of a lot cheaper than the Veritas. Um, and it's got a side grip, so you can, particularly if you're using narrow chisel, very handy. And that, I don't actually, yeah, you just screw that in there like that. Oop, other way around. around. And then... Yeah, I've, I've had both of these, and um, I'm transitioned to the Veritas because I found I was able to get a more consistent result. This is a funny story, I'm not sure if you remember this, but years ago, the first time we met, I was demonstrating some stuff at Timicon, and I brought all of my chisels along, oh, yeah. which I used to sharpen by hand without a guide. Yeah. And I thought I was pretty good at it. But what I hadn't realised was that over time, the end of the chisel was no longer square. It was actually slightly trapezoid. Mm. And you were like, oh, you just throw it in one of these, one of these Veritas things. That didn't embarrass you, did I? Oh, you probably mortified me. Probably yeah, it was rocked. you and Dan. Dan yeah. Barker was there yeah. too. And you ran it on the stone, and then I was able to see how far off square I was. Yeah. And from then on, that's when I bought the Veritas. What, what I, this particular one, don't get me wrong, these, these work, they're economical too, but it doesn't have a measuring device for the angle. Mm. Because you have to build your own by making a little jig and I can't be bothered doing that, so I'll just spend the extra money and go with the Veritas, um, which has it built in. So this little Duva. We do have a dedicated video that Shelton and I made years ago on the Veritas MK2. Yeah. Uh, if you search for that in within the Timbercon channel, you'll find an in-depth video on how to set this up and use it, yeah. um, just in case we don't have Keep them talking. time for... <laughs> Pusher. <laughs> Basically, yeah. it is it is a little complicated to set up. No, it's just getting used to it in your hands. Yeah, that's all it is. No, it's not complicated. It's just it was set to do that chisel there, which I'm pretty happy with at the moment. Yeah. Pop it in the jig. It's set that's set to angle, which is about what, what this jig allows you to do is always go back to that exact same angle every single time, and so that's why that goes onto the device. John has put the chisel in set it up against this little stop, and he knows it's gonna be exactly where it was last time, which means you're not removing any more material than you need to. You're not changing the angle to, to a place where you don't want it. Um, and it just gives you that consistency that gives you a really nice, sharp chisel. All right, so we won't go through the whole process because we'll be here till later, because this chisel needs a bit of work. A really nice feature about this as well is that once you set your primary bevel, and this, this yep. angle is 30 degrees, there's this little dial here on the side, and you can just tick that up, and I think it takes it up about two degrees, and you can set a micro bevel. The main cutting edge is the 30 degrees. The micro bevel means that you can maintain that for longer. It doesn't make it sharper, yeah. it just maintains it for longer. So, you know, rather than going back and resetting 30 degrees, you just you take that tip off. Take the tip off, take yeah. the tip off, until yep. you need to restructure the blade. Yep. Right, so, would you move from 1,000, in, if you were doing this normally, you'd move the, from the 1,000 stone up through the Well, grips. that's what I'll talk about now. So I flatten the back at 1,000. Then I would move to the 6,000. And I would flatten the back with that as well. So I'll take my back up to 6,000 so it's mirror. Mm -hmm. And I think if you look at that chisel there, this is from the other day, you can see there's a mirror finish on there. I don't know if you can catch And that's that. off your 6,000 stone. That's off the 6, yep. yeah. Actually, yeah. It's a little bit smudged, but it's 6. Um, then I pop it in the jig, and I will do a, um, a 1,000, mm -hmm. a 6,000, and I'll do my micro bevel at 10,000, which is this pink stone at the front yep. here. And so that's my basic setup for yep. sharpening. 1,000, 6,000, 
10,000. Um, and you can touch the back up as well with a 10,000 stone um, if you, you know, have nothing better to do. But the sharper, the more, the higher grades you go, the more fine scratches we'll take out of the, out of the tool steel, the tool steel. And this, it's the scratches that blunten the stone, so the, more, the, the chisel. So the more scratches you remove by the fire and grip, the sharper you can make so the chisel. So you're really aiming for that really high polish on the surface. Polish is better. Yeah. Yeah, cut. As you long know, as you've set that edge right. There's no point having a shiny, shiny chisel, but the edge hasn't been set first by that 1000. That's why you go through the stages. I go through the so I'm polishing it out and yeah. then basically um, get up to 30 degrees or whatever the angle you're choosing to work with. 30 degrees is the, is the great all-round purpose blade. Mm. I find 25 degrees, which is a lovely pairing angle for chisels. But when you're moving Australian timbers, you risk crumpling that edge because it's just not a, a fat enough mm. edge in order to hold it. Yep. Once you've got, gone through 1, 6 and 10, then you can pull out your strop. I made this strop a while ago. Kangaroo leather. A little bit of honing compound. Does that mean it's extra bouncy? <laughs> One of the guys ran into a kangaroo on the way to work the other day. Whereabouts does he live? I don't know. Whoop, whoop. Yeah. <laughs> I think he lives in Craigieburn. Yeah. Craigieburn, yeah. I think it gave him a fright too. This is a 100 kilogram thing. Money. Hopping. So you can put some like, honing compound on your... Uh, on your uh, strop, and I won't use that, I'll use number one here. Now I've noticed your strop has a rough side and a smooth side. Yeah, I think that just for, you know, starting to, to buff the chisel up, and then for a finer touch up on yep. the back. Do you reckon the rough side holds a bit more of that compound in the fibres? Um, probably, I've, no one's ever asked me that. So I just run along the back like so, and I'll do the same for the tip. Now, I remember Gary saying that... Because what you're doing there, when you grind, you're creating a little micro bevel, or what do they call it? Like a little... Oh, know? it's like folds this little wire on A little, fire, little wire, wire line. On the edge. And you're taking that off, essentially. And this is good, too. Like, if, you, if you're doing a bit of pairing with a hardwood, like the red, the red gum, you can just strop occasionally just to bring that edge back up. And, you know, and that, that's pretty sharp. So. Can I shave with it? Ooh, I don't know if you can shave... Oh yeah. Oh yeah. There's hair. Yeah. Good Bring job. forth your beard, Nick, and we'll <laughs> shave you now. No, that's no, lovely. we won't do it. Okay. <laughs> I used to um when I when I used uh, whetstones like this, I never had a strop. I just I wasn't aware of it. No one had ever shown it to me, mm. and I didn't didn't think it was a thing. Mm. I still got really sharp chisels because I took it up to well, actually, I only ever took mine up to six thousand, so they were sharp enough. Six thousand, yeah. Um, now uh, that I use, I got introduced to the strop strop actually through a whetstone sharpener, which we'll show you in a second. I'm sorry, a grinder, rotary sharpener. Mm. And now I see the value in a strop. So they're oh, inexpensive. Yeah. It really, really makes a difference to the surface of your blade. I bought the leather online for like $30, I think. Yeah. I've got a piece of red gum. There's plenty of it kicking around this workshop. I glued it to either side and then trimmed it up and bang. Yeah, I mean, you can get an old secondhand belt from Savers, chuck it on a piece of wood. That's a strop. The stones I've been using are Pride Water Stones made in North America. The, there's another brand that we sell at Timbercon called King, which are very good. I find these a little harder, and particularly in the higher end stone. The, the entry, the, the first stone, the 1000s are a little soft, but the, the 10,000s are just gorgeous. Um, and we do sell them in a laminated stone, so... Because you need three stones, you need, you need the three. To save a few bucks, you can go with a, a, a 1,000, 6,000 combo. I have a 1,000, 6,000 combo. For a lot of people who are just doing work at home, enthusiast work, who aren't doing really high-end precision joinery, that may be all you really need with a good strop. So that's my story. If you guys have got any questions about this little setup, just let us know. What's the web address? I can't remember it. The tiny work... Tiny no, I think it's just tinyworkshop at timbercon.com. Tiny workshop. Email in, we can send you some information. Should we go into the next phase? I think we better, or none of us are going to get any dinner. So okay. Yeah. I can't believe you um, leave your stones wet all the time. What I just sent them 20 minutes. What does the internet the... say? Uh, nearly everyone said that they leave theirs in water. Oh. I can't believe you take your stone out of the water I all do. the time. 
I'm just no, I do. I don't. There's no need to leave them soaking. Trust me. Anyway, but I don't think it hurts them. Well, does it? I think that some of those softer stones might yeah. get a little soft. So, well, just saying. Possibly. All mm. right. So I was messing with this crown chisel. All right. So this is called a wet stone grinder. It has a big stone that is wet because it is in, in this water bath and it also has a stropping wheel. Now, is it wet W-E-T or W-H-E-T? I think it's just wet. Okay, okay. Um, but in terms of what grit this is, I don't exactly know. But... I'd say it's probably... Oh, I reckon it's probably around about 1,000, yeah, 800. Yeah, it definitely feels coarser than those stones, but yeah. what I can tell you is you can still get a really sharp edge. Now, this That's is... That's a complete guess too. I must, we must yeah. find out. This is the Sherwood machine. Basically, you've got this bar, which allows you to use a variety of jigs and hold your chisels at a, very, at a certain angle or your other tools at a certain angle on this stone first. And once you've done that, you take it to the strop. I'm going to go through this process with this crown chisel that we found laying around the workshop. It's a little bit messed up and it needs a bit of work in all facets. It needs the back flattened slightly and it needs to reset that angle. Do you use the side of the wheel to flatten? Absolutely. Do you? Yep. And I'll show you how. I even I've done that. I've, I've owned wet stones in the past myself. So. You've got to be really careful if you're trying to flatten the back on one of these that you don't inadvertently take the tip off. You're rounded all of a sudden you have to take off so much material. So I like to rest my hand on this guide. I like to put the back of the blade on the stone just really lightly. You don't want to gouge the back of the stone, but it's always better to take material off there inadvertently yeah. than the tip. This is pretty heavy stuff, man. So you just touch that on the back, then you gently press it into the tip. And I'm bracing against this um, bar here. And when you go to take it off, do that in reverse. Don't pull off this way because you'll scallop that arm end yeah. and you'll ruin, ruin the thing. So, doing that again from the heel, from the back, just touching, pressing the front on, putting some pressure on with my thumb. It doesn't make any noise either, does it? No, apart from that Whining annoying sound. Arm. And then when you go to take it off, pull back this way. So, if you're left with any... any did they teach you that at woodworking school? They did not. Okay, cool. But I like the shirt relief as well. That so. back is, is pretty good. And then you can take that to the strop, but we can do that later. The next thing we want to do is... Oh, this, so this is the strop, yeah? That is the strop, yeah. yeah so it's a piece yeah. of leather, leather that's impregnated with um, a, a compound, similar to what, what your strop is. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we'll use it in a really similar way. But first we want to set that bevel. Impreg All I can think of is the handmaid's tail, now you've said that. The strop. It starts at 8.30, don't miss it. <laughs> Have you seen any episodes of The Handmaid's Tale? Not the most recent episode, Ooh. but I mean, the, not the most recent season, but I have seen the rest of it. Mate, you want to throw 20 hours of your life away? Start watching that program. Okay, so the way that this works is you place the chisel inside this guide mm -hmm. up against the hard reference edge here. You tighten that up and it's important to make sure that it's in there Nice and flat. Now I've done that a little bit wrong. I need to reset that. It's not actually square because I've put it in too far. Mm. It's important that the that we're actually using the flat edge of the chisel there. Up well, against that you'll fence. get a skew otherwise. Yeah. yeah. So you tighten up this one first, then you tighten up this one. Make sure it's nice and firm. With the, with the wheel not running, I'm going to rotate this machine so that you can get a really good image side on. We can rest the chisel there. I'm just going to put it there for a sec while I get the other important thing with one of these. This is the angle setting guide. So it allows you to make sure that your chisel is in exactly the right position and you can change its angle by raising and lowering this bar. Yeah. And if you're purchasing a product like this, that comes in the box with the machine, the angle setting guide and the straight blade jig. And I believe, does it, have, does it include the, I can't remember if it includes honing compound or not. Mm, it's okay. on the website anyway, what's included. Basically, you rest one end of this guide on the chisel blade. You set the butt of it, the heel of it on the stone. 
I've preset the angle I want to achieve, which this chisel is around 25, so I'm just going to go for 25. Yeah. And then you do that until <laughs> this little reference edge here lines up square with the chisel. When you, when you have, if you have one of these machines, it's all explained pretty well in the book um, or many other places on the internet. Then you can lock this bar in place. And while you mention that, on the TimberCon YouTube channel, Mr. Du Jeffrey Dubay, who was here last week, Mr. Jeffrey Dubay said he's done a YouTube video on using the Tormac, so make sure you check that out. On his own channel, on TimberCon's channel. No, not Tormac, sorry, the um, Sherwood machine here yep. in the store. Okay, now that the angle is set, we're going to turn the machine on. We're, we're running the stone into the blade rather than away. Um, in theory, you can do either, but this is faster. Uh, it gives a really nice consistent edge. Depending on how much material you need to remove will depend on how hard you want to press, but really it's, it's a medium pressure. I'm not, I'm not putting a ton of weight on that. If you want to have a look at how much material is being cut, you can lift up the chisel and, and look at it and make sure that you're getting good consistent material removal. You want to move back and forth across the face of the stone so that you're not wearing down the stone unevenly. Um, That's a good question. So what happens if the stone gets we worn? Unevenly. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a truing tool yeah. which allows you to reset the stone to square by removing some material. Oh, okay. Uh, it's pretty simple That's to use. Thing over there, yeah. yeah. So okay. now that I have set a nice edge on that, I can feel a really thin wire edge on the back, which is how I know I've removed as much material. I mean, I've moved material Ooh. consistently along the face. Now I'll take it to the strop. Okay. Now with the strop, you go in the How opposite direction. How do you feel about the concave bevel? It does my head in. What about it? I don't like it. Why? Oh, I don't know, I'm old fashioned, I'm yeah. old. I, 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 that's why I went back to Waterstones. I mean, I've used one of these, not mm. this kind of model, different model, and not as complicated, or not as sophisticated is the word, but I couldn't dig the, the negative curve in it. The, yeah. yeah. I mean, I've just found that the, the speed at which I can get my chisels sharp and back into making stuff is so much faster with this. Don't Steve. get me wrong. I loved oh, my mornings yeah. listening to a new, well, like yeah. a... If you Elliot, want to make a living though, forget it. Yeah, forget Elliot it. Smith album, spend an hour, you know, sadly. Elliot Smith, really? Oh yeah, big Actually. fan. <laughs> Sharpening my stones and, you know, feeling my feelings. Yeah, okay. But then when I'm actually doing a job and I need my chisel sharp, and I need them to be sharp now, I've ju I just use this. Cool. When you're using the strop, don't put the chisel into the leather. It'll rip all Clear. that leather off. Um, do the back first. Firm pressure. What you're trying to achieve is a nice mirror finish. And you do the front, exactly the same as what John did, but this is lazy because I don't have to move. The machine's moving for me. Um, I go back and forth. And then that should be good enough. Okay. So. Obviously, this thing sharpens other stuff besides chisels, yeah? Look at that. Nice and sharp. Yeah, so this will sharpen many things. I have a little... Actually, that's really impressive, isn't it? ...little Mora carving knife here. Uh, one thing to mention, when, since Gary is watching us, when he was demonstrating uh, this machine uh, almost a year ago when we did that... Tiny, oh, what was it called? Uh, Timicon Live. We're going to do an episode soon, so stay tuned. Subscribe and you won't miss it. He went from here to his, his 10,000 or his yeah. 16,000, just to touch up the tip. Do you add an, a micro bevel? No, no. I only ever, and most of the time I find that when I'm doing work, I just bring it back to the strop. I yeah. almost never go back to the stone unless I've, re unless yeah. I've dropped it yeah. or I've really done a lot of hard work. Yeah. Um, this machine can sharpen knives, axes, I feel like an infomercial. Um, scissors. Scissors. Uh, you can either do it by hand or you can, there are jigs mm. for small knives, jigs for large knives, jigs for axes, uh, all kinds. You said there's a jig for a really long planer blade? Yeah, you can yeah. get one for that, yeah. All kinds of things. What do you feel about the small wheel? Oh, I mean, there's le I, don't, I don't think it would make that much of a difference. You have a much steeper concave, uh, the thing that you don't yeah. like yeah, yeah, yeah. is deeper. 
more pronounced. More pronounced, yeah. I think that if you're into woodworking, go with the larger stone. If you're into just sharpening knives, I think the small stone is fine. Yeah, I think that, that's yeah, probably right. Yeah. yeah. Um, definitely your plain hand plane blades. Sure. Machine other other machine Where's blades. What's that beautiful knife you had before? Uh, that's a good question. It's disappeared. No. So I have a couple other things that you can sharpen. Oh, look at that. This is your little fishing bag, yeah? It's my, actually my spoon carving kit. So Ooh. that's a little tomahawk that I sharpened on this. If you're going to sharpen curved gouges like this, what you can do is rest the collar of the gouge on this bar, yeah. set the height so that that angle is where you want it. Generally with these, I'm not using the angle guide, although yeah. you probably could. The angle on these gouges is so shallow yeah, yeah. that it's... Um, oh, but I if mean, you're really into preciseness, you can buy a jig to do gouges, yeah. turning tools, all that stuff. So yeah. yeah, and it would give you a more consistent result than just sure. doing it by hand. But I've sure. been doing mine by hand, sure. touching up the back like that. Yeah. And then you can take this internal side, not onto the stone, but you can take it onto the strop. And there's all, I believe that there's other strops that you can add which have concave. I really want whatever. one of them. Do you guys sell them? Yeah, we do. All right. And so you can Get do carving them. chisels and stuff as well. So these are quite a, quite a universal piece of kit because if you want to do a gouge on a straight blade, a straight stone like this, you know, you're in flip country, like flip, flip. flip. Yeah. And that's yeah. great, but it can take you a bit of time. 45 minutes. Right, we, we're running out of time. So we want to touch base about... Jacko Jackson from WA. Now, Jacko wants you. Are you? You're familiar with this now, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. So Jacko wants a step stool. He does. Jacko's like a really interesting guy. Um, he's that tall. He plays rugby. He's Welsh, and um, he decorates wedding cakes, which I thought was quite amusing. Rugby themed wedding cakes. And I, we looked at a number of these cakes, and they're fantastic. So. We bought a little bit of time by slotting in a sharpening episode because we needed a bit of time to um, work wanted, out how to, to deal with it. I wanted to make sure that when we started this project, we actually had a really uh, well thought out plan and potentially even a model of what we were going to build for you. Yeah, so when we start, the next, when we start with uh, the project next week, we should have the thing made in advance so then we can study how we put it together. The, the first, it's actually quite complex because Jacko's got two kids and they're different heights. They're actually his grandchildren for the record too, which I found out yesterday. Wow, you don't look old enough for grandchildren. Anyway, so that complicates the design a lot. And so Patrick spent a bit of time pushing around some drawings mm. and we've estimated the cost of this to build at about $16,000 at this point, <laughs> where we can get one from Ikea for... Um, we're about 15 bucks. Yeah, but so <laughs> that's not the point because we've what got to make... What this object is, if you're not following along, is it's a little stool that you put up to a kitchen bench yeah. so the kid can be higher so that they can help you with the cooking or the cleaning or, or whatever's going on yeah. on the bench. So we're, we're working on the design and we've got some drafts coming up, but we also had a bit of a competition going. We're not going to announce that tonight because we're still waiting on... What is this thing called? All right, which is a good point. Basically, for kids and children. Now, we had a few people, um, Mr. Fix It Fingers. Hello, Fix It Fingers. He called it, what do they call it? That school? Montessori. Montessori. Because yeah, I can't spell called it. Called a Montessori. Montessori bench. school. Nice. Um, I don't know if that's actually actually, but I think he had a second crack at it and called it the learning stool. I think that's a Montes I think Montessori calls it the learning stool. That sounds a bit weird to me because what? I don't know. It's like, um, apparently though, the learning stool was the most popular. Um, I think Mike B. Thanks, Mike, for watching the show. Lots of people thought that. Yeah. yeah. All right, so. Someone called it the toddler tower. Toddler tower. Uh, what, um, old mate called it the giddy up. Giddy up, yeah. There's yeah. A, I don't understand that one. Um, we got an email from John Clyde and Benigo. Hi, John. Um, dear Tiny Workshop, love the show. We love you too. Um, just a shame more people don't watch it, but we're working on that. Um, he always says there's two things he can take away from his dad to his school base each week. He wanted to call it, actually, it's quite a long, rambling video. Oh, the safety step, which is not a bad name. So this brought up an important point. 
does this Duva need a rail behind the kid? Mm. Because they're at the spec, they've got side rails. Now, we know we live in a nanny state, though we are in Victoria, so we automatically are in a nanny state, but um, another person pointed out that sometimes with that rail there, the kid can climb up through it, which is kind right. of fun. you can just leave the rail there. Yeah, but I can see my daughter Jemima doing... Yeah. You know, that's another story. So that's a design consideration. If anyone's got any feedback on the reverse rail, we'd appreciate that. The best answer to date is from Peter Bennett, who um, took, obviously is a scholar and studies Latin and suggested could be, should be called the stabit. The stabit, S-T-A-B-I-T, is the Latin translation of the word stand. And um, did you see that TV series, The Stand, years ago? No, Stephen I don't know King it. thing, very no. scary. Um, translated homage to the university and the timeless nature of Mr. Jackson's family. It's a beautiful story. At this point, I'd say Peter is actually... Leading the pack. There's still time, so get your, if you have a suggestion for what we call this step stool, yeah. get it in. $50 gift voucher up at stakes. And we'd like some feedback on whether we need to put a reverse rail in there in order to stop the kid tumbling backwards and banging their head on the tile. So next episode, we will be coming to you with this thing mainly built so that you can see all of it. And then we'll go through step by step every single join, every process, mm. and we'll have it there to demonstrate for you. Sounds like a plan. All right. All right. Thanks for watching the Tiny Workshop. Thanks for all your comments. We absolutely yeah. read them. I, I always uh, go back afterwards and watch and read those. So thanks for all of the comments. and Thanks for Gary Rizzola for letting us use his image all over the internet and on the wall. <laughs> I love that. I want it on my bedroom wall. Um, maybe not the bedroom. Maybe in the living room, yeah. Um, <laughs> come back again next week, Thursday evenings at 7 for the Tiny Workshop. Um, and we'll be getting into whatever this thing's called. Thank you, Patrick, for your time. It's great to see you back. It's great to see you smile, mate. So, Good to be back. Yeah. Thanks, guys. We'll uh, see you next week. See you next week.